Hello. Um, so my name's Arthur Downing. Uh, by daytime, I'm a director of strategy at Octopus Energy. Um, by nighttime, I spend a lot of my time thinking, uh, reading, writing about the history of energy. Um, and I do that because I think you can't understand the energy system today. Oh, is this working? There we go. Without understanding its history. Um, if you think about it, each generation uh, builds infrastructure upon the last. And so decisions that are made very far back in the past cascade through time and shape the choices available to us today. Um, take this example. So uh, the Japanese electricity system, one of the most impressive in the world, but it's actually two systems. One half of Japan operates on the 50 hertz system, right? And the other half is on a 60 hertz system. Uh, this causes all sorts of operational complexities, right? This is not optimal. Why is it like this? Well, you have to understand the history of late 19th century Japan um, and the traditional rivalries between uh, Tokyo and Osaka. So back in the 1890s, um, uh, Tokyo decided to buy its generation equipment from the German firm AEW, sorry, AEG, and uh, the, the other half of the island uh, of Japan decided to buy from the, G uh, the American firm GE. And these just operated at different frequencies, and that's the reason, right? Um, now, I, I look for these all the time, and it's enormous fun, right? If you, if you find anything in the energy system that looks strange or out of place, it's usually because of some accident of history like this. Um, so, if we could zoom in, yeah. Um, this is a graph that went viral in a recent Economist uh, publication, and it shows um, how the world has consumed energy for the last 200 years and projected forward to 2050. Um, so each sort of line on the left is, is a, a years in 20-year increments, and then across the bottom, the width of each block represents you know, the volume of energy consumed from that particular source. So since 1800, we can kind of determine there's four energy transitions. So energy transition number one, sorry, there we go, um, begins in the 18th century in Britain and involves a transition from an organic to an inorganic economy. So coal uh, and steam power replace horsepower and wood. Um, this completely transforms manufacturing, first in the cotton industries and then other industries like railways and shipping. Um, transition number two uh, began, began in late 19th century America um, and involves the transition to other kinds of hydrocarbons, particularly oil. Right? Uh, and what's revolutionary at that point in time is, is, of course, the car, the internal combustion engine. But the other thing that's really important in energy transition number two is mass electrification which in many ways is even more revolutionary, right? It transforms lighting and then industrial processes and, and, and finally, you know, urban rail. Energy transition number three begins in about the 1940s and carries on through the middle of the decades. And this is where vast reserves of natural gas are discovered around the world. Um, the, the, the natural gas first is used for heating, industrial processes, but then electricity generation. And this has a profound impact even until today. Now, the energy transition we're living in right now, energy transition number four, it, it could be simplified as a double electrification. What this means is the electrification of all demand and the decarbonization of all generation. That's it. It boils down to those two things. And, and it's interesting because the epicenter of this energy transition is China. Right? And in, there's a sort of beautiful historical symmetry to this, because up until the 18th century, the center of the, the world economically was China. And it was energy transition number one in Britain that shifted that economic center of gravity to Europe. So in a way, we're kind of coming full circle. Right? So what makes the fourth energy transition distinct, special, different to the past? Well, the first thing is that it's going to have to happen at a ridiculous speed. So if you think about past energy transitions, they're extremely protracted affairs. Uh, coal only surpassed wood in terms of global consumption in 1900, and it only peaked in the 1960s. 
Whereas this time around, not only do we have to ramp up renewables very quickly, but we have to ramp down previous forms of fuels. The good news is that this energy transition is going to be efficient. So this is a chart from the Rocky Mountain Institute, um, and it's a wonderfully simple way of thinking about the energy system. Energy supply comes from either heat or work. So work is where you use solar or hydro or wind to move electrons, right? Heat, you just burn stuff. And the way that we use energy kind of mirrors this, right? Some things need heat, cooking. Some things need work, like moving wheels. Making、uh, work from heat is ridiculously inefficient, right? You just throw away tons of energy in the process. But making work from work or heat from work is really efficient, right? And this is what people have been referring to all morning. You know, a solar-powered EV is ludicrously efficient.、Um, This graph shows the share of primary energy converted into useful energy from 1900, and it's a kind of measure of the efficiency of the system. So, from 1900 to 1940, the efficiency of the system is about 23 percent, which is not great.、Um, and then, in the second energy transition that, that I was just mentioning, th- this efficiency level increases and it improves, but around about 1970, it just gets stuck. And, and the key thing is that at that point in time, we kind of reach the limits of efficiency from burning stuff. We've been trapped ever since. And this energy transition is about unlocking new levels of efficiency by moving to work sources and to work uses. The other reason why this energy transition is different is because this time around, the demand side is active.、Um, If you think about the electricity system of the 20th century, it assumed that people's demand for electricity was completely passive; it was fixed. You couldn't move it around in time, and so it made sense to build the energy system around large coal-fired plants and large hydroelectric plants that you could toggle up and down to match demand. This creates an industrial structure that, of course, benefits very large companies that can own and operate. This massive infrastructure, but if you fast forward to today, this energy transition is happening at the same time as another revolution in digital technology.、Um, between 2023 and 2030, you know the number of digitally connected energy devices will boom. You know, heat pumps, EVs,、um, solar panels, batteries, and what that means is that in a country like Britain, by 2035. Over half of the demand will be new and will be flexible, right? And that means that an electric vehicle can be plugged in, its charge can be shifted around to when the wind is blowing or the sun is shining, and the consumer can benefit from that. This is a revolution, right? This should create an industrial structure that benefits end consumers, because in a way, they're the ones that are keeping the lights on now. But this energy transition is far from certain, and I want to offer three quick lessons from history about what might trip us up. So, lesson one: we really need to stop being so worried about stranded assets. Lesson two: go around bottlenecks. It's good to kind of relax the constraints that cause bottlenecks, but if you look at history, really innovative solutions just go around them. And lesson three: be vigilant. The best technologies do not always win, especially if they don't serve the powerful. So let's go to each.、Um, I don't know if anyone knows this, but between the late 19th century and the middle of the 20th century, all gas pretty much was manufactured from coal.、Um, it was called town gas, and vast networks of pipelines were built、uh, to accommodate this kind of gas. It's there in black, the, the big pipelines.、Um, There were also thousands of manufacturing facilities around Europe to manufacture gas, and in homes, millions of appliances, from stoves to heaters, that were built just to accommodate town gas. So, when Europe discovers vast natural gas reserves in the 1950s and 60s, it kind of faces this stick or twist problem, right? Do we stick with town gas, or do we try and move over to natural gas and 
bear the costs of all of that, you know, transitioning, billions of dollars of assets that you might have to change. Some politicians at the time opposed this. So um, this is a quote from 1968 in the British Parliament. This is a politician who said, this policy involves the wholesale displacement of existing gas-making plant. What we shall be doing is writing off not obsolete equipment, but brand new, technologically up-to-date equipment. Any guesses for who that was? It was Margaret Thatcher. Um, now, what ended up actually happening? So, this shows you the volume of gas available to Britain between 1950 and 1978. And if you were there in 1968, you'd be looking at that sort of uptick in a, a, a gas available from oil, and you might be forgiven for thinking, well, why bother with all of this conversion, right? We're fine. We've got plenty of gas. Well, society didn't turn away from the opportunity that natural gas presented because it was worried about writing off the assets that it already had. Between 1968 and 1978, the volume of gas available to Britain tripled, and, and that in also involves you know, wiping, essentially writing off about 1,000 gas manufacturing plants. Also, amazingly, 37 million appliances in 13 million homes were replaced. Right? Lesson number two, go around the bottleneck. So, let's go back to Denmark in the 1970s. 90% um, of uh, national energy consumption was based on imported oil in 1973 in Denmark. And so the Danes kind of have this challenge, right? Do we try and relax the constraint? So that's one thing they did, and they started to develop um, uh, their own oil and gas fields, setting up companies like Dong Energy, right? But a far cleverer solution is to just go around the bottleneck altogether. So what did the Danes do? Well, really interestingly, Denmark becomes a pioneer of wind power. This is the rather fetching Twindcraft wind farm uh, from 1978. At the time, it was the biggest in the world. Uh, in 1991, Denmark uh, at Vindeby, uh, uh, it, it builds the largest and, and first offshore wind farm in the world. Um, and also what's interesting is that Dong Energy, which started as an oil and gas company, becomes Orsted, which now today is the, one of the world leaders in offshore wind, right? So if we fast forward today, what's the kind of implication? Well, I think everybody would agree that the electricity grid is kind of the bottleneck today. So all around the world, you've got connection queues forming of people trying to connect to the grid. Uh, congestion costs are rising, so this is where we pay generators to turn off because the grid can't handle the power. Um, and one way to relax this constraint is to build more grids. Um, so Lots of very respectable organizations say, look, we're just going to have to build a lot more grids. Um, and, and today, there's about 68 million kilometers of wires around the world. By 2050, we might need to go up to about 200 million kilometers. And, and that's a gargantuan increase in build rates, right? You have to remember that in some countries, like in regions like Europe or America or Japan, we haven't built grids for a very, very long time. And frankly, we're not very good at it, <laughs> right? Um, the, the, the US grid is often referred to as the world's largest machine. Um, and these maps show you how the transmission system developed from 1908 through to 1960. Um, a couple of things to note. All, um, almost all of the transmission up until kind of 1920 was actually built around renewables because it was hydroelectric. So, Grids and renewables have always been sort of deeply intertwined. The other thing to note is just how much grid was built between 1949 and 1960, right? That is a ludicrous amount of building. They were really good at building grids. And across the Atlantic in Europe, other countries also got really good at building grids. So um, this is from an IEA study, and it shows for each region of the world the projected growth rate in network length uh, and transmission level, so the high voltage wires, needed to hit net zero over the next 15 years. And if you, you look at it, it's kind of not surprising, like some Southeast Asia, Africa, India, China, these are the regions that need to build the most grid, because they've not, they're sort of electrifying very, very rapidly. But interestingly, you know, almost every region is still behind what a country like Britain was able to build at 
between 1955 and 1970. And also, interestingly, China between 2012 and 2022 built at its grid 8% every year, right? So I think it's really important that if we're serious about building our way out of this bottleneck, we need to kind of study what other countries are doing and look to our own past and try and work out how previous generations were able to build so much grid so quickly. Um, now, of course, the other thing we need to do is go around the bottleneck. Demand-side response, distributed energy, batteries, grid-enhancing technologies like dynamic line rating, these are technologies that weren't available to prior generations, and so it would be really daft to not use them to alleviate the pressure on the grid. But this brings me to my final lesson, which is a cautionary tale, really, because the best technologies do not always win. Um, let's go back to the first energy transition in 18th century Britain. The, the story goes that it was about replacing wood with coal, right? and the steam engine becomes a really critical part of the Industrial Revolution. But interestingly, the first mechanized cotton mills were all powered by renewables. They were all powered by water. Right? But water lost comprehensively to the steam engine. Why? Well, one reason is because it took a lot of coordination between different uh, factory owners to build the kind of infrastructure to do wind. Uh, water. And the other reason was the impact it would have had on wages. So moving your factories away from urban areas where the water power was would have had an impact on wages because labor would have been less scarce, and so you would have sorry, more scarce, so you would have had to pay more. Right? W one of the things we can comprehensively now say is that it wasn't because water was running out. So the traditional story goes that we replaced water with coal because coal was abundant and water was scarce. Uh, this is a map from 1838 in Britain, and it shows the utilization of available water power by each county. And you can see that, you know, in the light gray there, there was tons of water power available. And this really is one of the great what-ifs of economic history, right? What if the Industrial Revolution in early 19th century Britain had been locked in around water power and not fossil fuels? So the message I kind of want to land here is like, the energy transition is not inevitable just because we've got superior technology. It requires every technologist in this room to sort of engage with the history and the politics of climate change. Because if you don't, there are lots of very, very powerful people that want to ensure that the energy transition doesn't occur. And there is a real risk that some of our fabulous technologies become like the water wheel. <laughs>